forms we talked about um, server-side scripting and the role it plays in because it's impossible to talk about one without the other because typically that's the purpose of forms to gather data to send to the server so that the web server can do something with it. Now what the web server does with it depends on entirely on the, the application. Um, in the case of Google or Bing like we were looking at what we send to the server then becomes what it searches for and, and what it will display the results about. In other cases, it could be that you enter in a bid on eBay. And if you have the winning bid, then a database gets updated saying that now Mike has the winning bid on this particular item. All right. Um, when you go and place an order on Amazon, there's an order form that you fill out. You know, when you submit that, that updates their order database and sets in motion you getting shipped. In Angel, when you upload an assignment, it sends the files and updates the database so that I can go and grade the stuff. So forms are typically used to send data to the server. And what the server does with it, again, often is some sort of interaction with the database. Not always, but often. Um, and then displays the results, tells you what happened. You know, yes, your 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 file uploaded, or no, it did not upload because it's too big, or, or something along those lines. So we, uh, we, we saw how that mechanism worked, and I'll pull that example up in a minute, and we can review it just to make sure that we're clear on that. Um, we have three things to do um, more related to forms. One, we need to look at some of the other form controls, all right, because Last time we just looked at text boxes and submit buttons. Well, there's a, there's a whole slew of other form controls, uh, including some new HTML5 uh, controls. So there's that to do. Then there is styling of the forms. In other words, so far I've been putting the form, you know, well, our forms have been very, very simple, so there really hasn't been much to them. Um, but how to style them and make them look good. And sort of related to that, because we'll probably talk about them sort of simultaneously, is making the forms accessible. And what are some of the accessibility issues that forms, uh, forms create for, for people that are visually impaired? So let's bring up the example from last time and look at it. I was just thinking, I wonder if I can, I should contact these people and see if they could like sponsor my classes and, and like, I could like, you know, take a sip and it's like, wow, this Sam Pellegrino sparkling grapefruit beverage is delicious. It feels refreshing and it puts my mind at ease so I can have a good day of web development, you know. So if you guys are out there, you know, give me a call. I have hesitated to do that, by the way, because on YouTube videos, you can, of course, as we all know, anyone that's ever watched a YouTube video, you can, you can add ads. So I, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that ethically, though, because it's like, you know, you don't, we don't want a commercial in your class, you know, unless they're going to give me some free cases of, of this, then, then maybe we'll have a commercial for them. All right, so pulling up the example from last time. Our form looks like this, simply consists of a text box, all right, and a submit button. We can type something in, click the search button or the submit button, and because we've wired this to go to uh, the, the Bing search engine, um, it calls their page and shows the results based on the search string that, that we've searched for. 
If we look at the code here, we'll see that If we look at the code here, we'll see that really is pretty simple here. We have a form tag that wraps around everything that we're sending to the server in sort of a package. This particular form only has the one field well, plus a button, but a form can actually have a bunch of fields, all right, in, in, including a, a button. Um, yes? If I wanted to say I had a web page and I wanted to put a, a thing Mm -hmm. This is a convenience for my users. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way without server-side scripting that I can save the, what they type in the search box to someplace on my website without server-side scripting? No. Okay. no. The question was about saving data that a user put in on a form. And, and that would require um, some form of server-side scripting. All right, our form tag wraps around everything. We have an action here, and that is the script that's going to get called. All right, in this case, we're using the one from Bing. Method get simply relates to how the data is passed from one page to another. Input type equals text is a text box. Name equals Q. I chose Q because that's what this script is expecting. I, I looked at, I did a search and I looked at what it's ex expecting. And then a type, a, su a submit button, and the value search Bing is simply the, the text that's going to appear on the button. A submit button by definition sends the form data to this script. So that's the mechanism by which the client that is our web browser communicates with the server and passes the data. Your two options on method are get and post. With get, if we notice, we can actually see as part of the query string the values that were entered on the form. All right, so Q equals HTML. That's one way of getting HTML5. That's one way of getting data from the client to the server is passing it on the query string. The other option is with a method of post. And notice that this isn't working. All right. Why isn't it working? Well, apparently the Bing search engine expects you to use the get method. So when I use the get method, it worked. When I use the post method, it doesn't work. Simply a different way of passing the data. All right. Um, notice it's not included in the, in the query string. It's passed in another manner that's transparent. So if you're passing something sensitive, like a password or, or something, you might want to do it, not do it via the query string. I'll change it back to get so this works again. And it, it works again. All right, so the key parts of this, form tag, script that gets called, how we're passing the data, the stuff that we're, the, the, the text box is simply a free form single line of text, the submit button is what kicks everything off and sends the data in the form to the server. All right, let's look at some other examples 
of form controls. And just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to save a copy of this guy. And I'm going to save, I'm, I'm going to allow the user to choose from a list of search terms. Now I know that's kind of goofy, right? You'd never really want to do that. Probably not. Um, but it will demonstrate the way that some of these other form controls work. Um, especially the drop down. That's the next one I want to cover. A drop down is not with an input tag. It's with a select tag. So select means drop down. A drop down is a list of options that the user has. Every option has a value and it has a value that's displayed on the screen for the user. They could be the same, but for demonstration purposes, I'm making them different. For those of you that have ever done any database interactivity, a lot of times the, 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 the value that's displayed is something that is descriptive, something that's meaningful to the user. So maybe it would be the, the item description. You know, we have a, you know, we have a, a men's extra large t-shirt, you know, solid gray. That's something that's, that, that the user is going to understand, right? Whereas the value of the option might be something that the server needs, like maybe the item number, item number ABC579, all right? If we display that, the user has no idea what item number ABC579 is, so that won't be meaningful to the user. But that's what the server needs to do its job. All right, because it's going to hook to a database, and the database is going to have items stored by their item number, and so on and so forth. So a lot of times what you will do is you will have a description that's intelligible to the end user between the start and end option tag, and then you will have the value of the option being whatever the script needs on the other side. Now, either you're the person writing the script, and you know what the script needs on the other side, or someone will tell you. So, I've built a very limited search page that will only allow me to search for these items. And again, not terribly useful, but it's useful in demonstrating the way a drop-down works. So, if I go and view this page, there I have my drop-down. Notice what's being displayed in the drop-down is what I put between the start and end tags for the option. All right. If I go and pick something, I'll pick cascading style sheets and click submit. Notice it actually did the query on CSS though. Why? Because the value is what gets passed to the server. All right. So the value is what the server is going to see. Between the option tags is what the user sees. Now, this points out an interesting thing. I just changed the text box to a drop-down, and it works identical, right? 
On the server side, it doesn't really know where the data is coming from. All right. As long as we give something on the query string called Q, all right, this script will work and this script will take it and do a search. Doesn't matter if Q is a text box, if Q is a set of radio buttons, if Q is anything. All right. Um, as long as we have a form item named Q, it'll work. All right. So all data from a form, and the reason that I did this particular example with the drop down, even though it's sort of a goofy way to do a search, is to demonstrate that all data from a form gets passed the same way, regardless of the data that it contains. So Q equals HTML. Well, it got passed on the query string because I called the drop down a name of Q, and the option that I selected, hypertext markup language, had a value of HTML5. Questions? I'm going to build a third example where we're going to explore everything. And this particular example isn't going to be hooked up to any server-side script. All right? So, um, because I don't have a server-side script ready to do all these things. So I'm just going to, to, to create the form, and it would pass the server-side script in the same way. So let me go and let me save a third copy of this guy. And I'm no longer going to post to that page. I'm going to omit the action. And when you omit the action, the page submits back to itself. Now, that may seem odd to submit back to itself, but a lot of times that's how PHP and ASP.NET pages are coded. They contain both the logic for the form and the logic for processing the form data once it's submitted. So it's not uncommon for a form to, to, to call back itself. All right. I'm going to give my button a name, too. And we'll see that even the button is going to get passed on the query string because it has a name. It didn't get passed before because it didn't have a name. So there's my submit button. Let's add a text box. So input type equals text, name equals username, or I a lot of times will put in front of the name a little abbreviation that says that this is a text box, but by no means do you have to do that. That's just sort of my convention. Helps me keep things straight. And I'll have a drop down for the student's major. And that'll be a select, because it's a drop down. The name equals major. There's not name for an individual option, so there's just a name for the drop down as a whole. And I could put as many options as I wanted to here. Now, here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the value as being the codes that we use here at LCCC. So CISS and the name of CISS is actually Computer Information System.
I'll go and put a few more options on here, even though we know that CISS really is the only important option. No, I'm just kidding. I will keep it on top, though, just as. think of. I can't think of any other majors. <laughs> uh, yeah, economics, sure. I was, a, uh, I was a computer information systems major and an accounting minor. That's why I came up with those two, probably. Um, and um, that doesn't look right. Mathematics. Is that right? No, no, no. It's whatever, whatever the script would expect. All right. So, um, I think in the previous example, I'm trying to remember. I think they all were, except accessibility. I think was in a, in mixed upper and lower case. It turns out it's just a coincidence here. It doesn't have to be. It's whatever your script would be expecting. All right, and typically the majors here are listed with a capital letter, so I just follow that convention. All right, let's go and look at this guy, and we'll see sort of a mess. Well, not a mess, but it doesn't look particularly pretty. We have a name, choose major, and that isn't so bad for this, but if you think about if we added some more things, like if we added an address and a phone number and, and all that, it would stretch across and it would get to be kind of kind of tough to, to manage. And again, I can go in and pick and I submit form and notice that there's text name on the query string, major, and BTN submit. That indicates that the submit button was clicked. It didn't happen in the other case because I didn't have a name for the button. If, okay. Now, notice that when we load the page initially, there's always one item selected in the drop down. All right? So if I don't do anything and click submit, it says that the major is CISS. Now that can either be good or bad, right? The good part of it is, is that allows us to set defaults. For example, if I had a web page for prospective students for Lorain County Community College, probably most students that attend Lorain Community College live in Lorain County. So I could have, what's your residency? What county do you live in? And I could by be pretty safe to put Lorain County on the top of that list and make it the default because there are students from other counties, but most students are from Lorain County. So I could make that the default. Um, and then I could put underneath it Cuyahoga County, you know, uh, Medina County, Erie County, and the other more likely ones. All right. If, however, I was doing city, all right, I don't know if there are, you know, there certainly, is, there certainly are cities where there are more or less people, but I don't think that, that there is a single city that is so prevalent that I would want to make it the default. The danger of making something a default that shouldn't be a default is that people won't pay attention and won't change it and will we'll just click right through it. So if I were, for example, to make, to put the cities in alphabetical order, and what would the first city in Lorain County be? Amherst, let's say, yeah, then I'll bet you that there'd be a number of people that wouldn't pay attention and just click through without selecting their city, all right? And I'd have probably erroneous data because people would put in Amherst without doing that. So sometimes what you do is you put a dummy value in front of it. Like, for example, in this case, maybe this was a page about computer programming. Like, if you want more information, you know, contact us. 
if it was a page about computer programming, I could probably assume that most of the people visiting the page were CISS majors. But if this was maybe, say, a more general uh, page on, on the college's website, you know, like about financial aid or something that, that you know, there was no particular bias towards one major, then what I might want to do is I might want to put a default at the top of the list, sort of a dummy value, and say, please select major. If that were the case, I would probably also want to arrange them in alphabetical order. As a general rule, you should arrange the items in a drop down either in sort of order of popularity or in some other logical order namely alphabetically or numerically or something like that. Like if you had a drop down for year that the person was born, you know, you'd have it in, in numbered order. All right. If you can't think of anything that would be more popular, for example, if I really didn't like know like which majors were the most popular or whatever, I would just arrange them in like a logical order like alphabetical. All right. But for something like county, I might put Lorraine on the top, then Cuyahoga, Medina, you know, the surrounding counties. So if we go and look at this again, we'll notice that the first item that comes up is please select major. Now, we're going to deviate from our new form controls to format this form a little better. All right, before we go on any further. Yes? Mm -hmm. By putting that um, thing that I can is there a way to force them not to submit the form without selecting it? Excellent question. The question was, is if I put a dummy value on top of this, like please select major, is there a way I can prevent them from submitting the form um, without choosing an actual major? And the answer is yes, but that requires JavaScript. There are some HTML5 controls, and HTML5 enabled browsers have put some options, and probably at the end of our form discussion, we'll look at HTML5 form stuff. But um, for most browsers, yes, you would have to write JavaScript to do that. Just like you'd have to write JavaScript to make sure that someone put a value in the name. All right. Or if you had something like a birthday uh, field that, that someone selected a valid date, you know, that they didn't put in June 58, 1923, you know. Well, 1923 part might be valid, but not the June 58th part, all right? Okay. So let's make this look better. We're going to make this better. And we're going to make it a little bit more accessible at the same time. All right? How are we going to make this look better? Well, a form is really just a list of fields that get submitted to the server. All right? We've already seen a tag for lists, and that is the UL or OL tag. Generally speaking, it's considered that a form is an unordered list. In other words, yeah, there's probably a logical list, but you could probably rearrange some things without really impacting the meaning. So, I'm going to create an unordered list for this. And each form field is going to become a list item. Now, I can almost guess what people 
or what some of you are going to either say or think when I first do this. You're going to say or think, gee, that doesn't look a lot better than it did before. All right? But we're not done yet. Now for this example, just for convenience, I'm going to put the style sheet embedded in the HTML form just so that we can look at both of them at the same time. So I go and save this and I now look at this. Well, that ain't a whole lot better. All right. We're moving in the right direction now. First thing we probably want to do is get rid of those stupid bullet points. Bullet points make list for uh, make sense for like a list of some things, but doesn't really make sense for a list of form fields. How do we get rid of the bullet points on a list? Does anyone remember off the top of their head? Display inline? No, that's what makes that's what would make a list go horizontally instead of vertically. Yes. Um, well, uh, it's actually list style type equals none. So I can go on the UL, I want list style type of none. Now, again, do I expect you to have that memorized? No. I mean, you don't know how many times I've looked this up before it finally sunk in that it's list style type. All right, I could never remember this one. I would every lecture I would give on this, I would say, um, "How do we do that again?" And I'd go and look it up. But sort of the philosophy of CSS is, hmm, if it deals with the appearance of something, I can probably change it via CSS. And therefore, I would start looking at what I could do style-wise, either on the UL or the LI, to change or get rid of the little bullet point. And if we look at that, all right, better. Okay. Now, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to use a label tag. And we're going to use a label tag for two things for two reasons. Reason number one is that it's for accessibility purposes. Reason number two is it will help us style our form. So this is a case of, of two things in one. All right, let, let me pull up a form. Let me go in. Let's say I want to create an account in, on Amazon. All right. We have all this information we have to fill in. They're all text box and a submit button. Now, what does this text box represent? The mobile phone number. What is this text box? Password. Now, how do you know that? And this almost sounds like a dumb question. How do you know that? Well, because the thing right next to it says, enter a new password. The thing next to it says, my mobile phone number is. My name is. So it's obvious. It's obvious to you that can see it. All right? Because you know, based on the rules of logic and visual language, that if there's a label next to a text box, that label describes the stuff that you put in the text box. All right. If you can imagine a screen reader reading someone the screen and possibly using your tab key to tab around the screen like this, I tab there, what field am I in? I don't know. I can't look to see what label is next to it. Therefore, the label tag helps us associate a label with a form control. All right. 
so that someone is visually impaired, why they can't physically, actually, with their eyes, read the label, the screen reader can read it to them. If it knows, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here. Uh, if it knows uh, what the label is associated with. So, you associate a label via an ID. Now, this is one thing that gets a little confusing for students because name is not the same as an ID. A name's a name, an ID's an ID. All right? A name is used for passing data from the client to the server. So you need the name in there. If you remember without a name, we didn't see the button. You know, the, the name helps, helps determine what gets passed. And it's the name that is going to be passed as. An ID, however, is used for other purposes. We'll use it in JavaScript, and we'll use it with these labels. So oftentimes, Form fields are going to have both names and IDs. What I typically do is make them the same. That way, it's just easier on me remembering, but it doesn't have to be the same. But the only exception of that is radio buttons. Because when we do a radio button, each radio button is going to have the same name, but they're each going to have different IDs. So when we, when we get to radio buttons, file that away in the back of your head. All right? So, I can give this guy an ID. Text name. And then, I can put around the word name a label tag. And I can say label for, and I can put the name of the ID in there. So, that will help screen readers associate this text box with this text. Question? So the screen reader would say vocalized name. Correct. Uh, again, different screen readers work differently, but yes. The idea would be to allow it so that the screen reader could say name. All right? Because now it knows. If I tab into this box, and there might be a keystroke to say, tell me what this field is. And the screen reader knows that, okay, it's the one associated. The label is, for this, is this guy. Because the ID here matches the ID there. Yeah. I'm going to make... Uh, a label for this guy as well. And I'm going to put a label for Now, if we do this, doesn't change the way it looks at all. All right? But behind the scenes those that this label is linked to this text box so that screen readers can associate and read the caption or read the label associated with that form field. Now, we didn't necessarily do it for this reason, but we can take advantage of this and we can style these labels. All right? For one thing, notice that this kind of doesn't really look good, right? The fact that this is staggered. It'd be nice if I could line up all these text boxes. All right? How do you, how could I line up, not text boxes, but form controls? How could I line up all of these form controls? Any thoughts? Okay, I could set the margin. The problem with that is that would give me a uniform amount of space between the label 
in, in the form field. But it would still depend on how big the label was. I can, but again, that won't do me any good. If I do this, for example, if I say input margin 10px well we're still going to run into the issue of so I set the margin on those two guys that it adds extra space, but it's still not lined up that way. Okay, so we can't really do that via a margin. What we can do is we can give the problem is oops, the problem is is that these labels are different lengths. This label name is this big. Choose major is this big. Well, what if we made the labels all the same length? All right, so with 50 pixels, maybe. Fifty obviously isn't big enough. All right, there we go. Now, what did I have to do? I had to also say display inline block. The reason is, is that I can only set the width on a block tag. All right, and therefore if I try to set a width on a label, it's not going to stick. Certain attributes can only be applied to block tags. But there's this nifty little sort of hybrid that's called inline block that allows me to, even though it is inline, set some of the block attributes, such as width. So, or I could do something like this with 10%, or do 20%. min width 100 pixels. To look like that. Now, what else could we do to really make this look spiffy? Yeah, let's, let's center that submit form. How can we do that? Well, let's center it. How would we do that? How can we do it just to this Li? Um, we don't really add, need to add a, a section to this. We can already put on, on this an ID or a class. For example, I could say class equals submit and I could say submit or dot submit text align 
center. All right. And that put it there. All right. Why? Well, because we centered it within the whole page. All right. Um, we could play with that to get it more like how we wanted it to be. Um, for example, I could say form with 70% min width 400px. Now it won't go any smaller than that, but as it gets bigger, like that. All right. Okay. What else might we want to do to make this look nicer? Yeah, we could do that. Let's look. Go ahead. Okay. We could put, we could do that. We could do that. How would we do that? How would we put space? between this and this. We don't use break tags in this class. Why don't we use break tags in this class? Because it has to do with the parents who do it in CSS. So you want to drop this down. A break tag would drop it down. But that break tag then is baked into the HTML and it would be very difficult to make it drop down even more. Or what if we wanted all our forms to be styled a certain way? All right. We already have a class for this line. What could we do to drop that down? We could add a margin on that. So I could say specifically a margin top 50px. And then that drops it down. All right. And what's more is we can we could change if I say, well, you know, that's too much, I could go and do 20 pixels. And if I put this in an external style sheet, then all my forms would behave this way. Now there's one last thing I want to do with this, because I kind of like. Notice how the labels are a line flush this way and not on this margin. So this is aligned. The left side is aligned on the form fields. The right side is aligned on the label. How could I do that? On what tag? On the label. So I can say text align colon right. And there we go. All right. And we've gone quite a long way from what we had originally. And we didn't do much of it in HTML. We just added the list structure for this to be a list of items. Uh, and we added the label structure for accessibility, but we took advantage of that label for styling. All right. Next time, we will wrap up the form controls. We'll look at some HTML5 form controls. We'll do a bit more for accessibility and styling. All right. We'll see you over in lab. <laughs>